engagement, connecting with people who have diverse opinions and backgrounds, travel, service, and personal reflection. Students who must successfully complete capstone project, the capstone project in order to earn their global studies diploma. Tonight, you will hear each senior present one aspect of the project. During the intermission, please join us up in the gallery for some food to talk to the seniors and see all the work they've done for this capstone project. Thank you. Love and love to talk about, like in many studies that have been reading. It actually 
functions like a normal city, actually, with schools, police, problems of their own, they're trying to figure out, maker districts, health facilities, and more. So if cities around the world learn from these cities, cities, places, and others to embrace the more and more people, it would and could make the world better. There'd be more innovation and entrepreneurship. Learning from Worcester, there'd be advanced in foreign born like business and education. In New York, you can learn from a city's workforce to be half foreign born what you can grow from that. And learning from a refugee camp known as the start, you can learn how to turn something that many people think is un undesirable and unlikable to something that's desirable, likable, and helpful. Just thought though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Because of where you live, 
owning a gun is often the only way to defend yourself and your family from harm. This is a much more common situation than a lot of people assume, and it's a very good reason to oppose gun control. So it is just a fact that America does have a disproportionate amount of gun violence. This is a graph, the x-axis is guns, gun ownership per capita, the y-axis is gun deaths per capita. And here you have a sampling of most first world countries in the world. Canada, Argentina up there on the high end, Switzerland, Chile, and then you have the United States. I just about 90 guns per 100 people, and per capita, a gun death rate per capita that's almost twice as high as the one in Argentina, and when not adjusted for population size, it is over three times as high as the one in which we can not <coughs> So you hear these statistics in the news all the time, right? And a lot of people see that as a good, necessary thing, educated people on gun violence. But I see it as an indicator of something that is wrong in our culture, something that's keeping us, that's holding us back from, an, from finding an actual solution. Because in reality, the majority of people believe that gun violence is a serious and tragic problem that needs to be addressed in America. This is a Gallup poll that shows just that. But even though there is this consensus, you still hear people arguing a foregone conclusion. And that's because not enough people make the effort to effectively communicate their opinions, their viewpoints, to people on the other side of the debate. And on the off chance that does happen, even fewer people are willing to listen to people on the other side. Now, I have been researching guns and gun violence all year, and of course I've drawn my own conclusions. I have my own opinions on what we should do about gun violence. But that's not what I'm here to present to you right now, because I do not have the answer to gun control. No one person does have the answer to gun control. What I'm here to say, what I'm here to say to you, is that if we want to mitigate gun violence, if we want to make America a safer place for everyone, we need to swallow our pride, effectively communicate to other people, and we need to listen. And then beyond that, we need to make sacrifices and compromises to make America safer for everybody. responded with with lawsuits 
and by driving film festivals not to show the films. But even more troubling, uh, New Hampshire groups went on the same service trip that we go on and returned, understandably upset at sugar companies for uh, treating their workers uh, in this difficult way, not providing them the essential services that we actually go down there and help out with. And they came, they posted on Facebook, they posted on Twitter, and as a result, Central Romano, which is the company that is owned by the Chicago, excuse me, is owned by the Van Jules, and uh, owns the sugar plantations that we go and uh, do service work on, got in contact with the mission that we partnered with, and threatened to stop allowing service groups onto the plateaus uh, and its retaliation for this negative press. So I'm going to ask that if anyone sort of feels motivated to tweet or go online with any information they see now, Please don't do it in any way that's associated with blockets and else we may lose that privilege as well. With that, the first bit of the sugar conspiracy begins with these two brothers. We have here Pepe and, uh, Pepe and Jose Andrew. They're a Cuban American family that grew up in the Dominican Republic. And they're actually the two wealthiest Dominican siblings, uh, siblings, citizens in the world. And that combined that worth of about $10 billion. The Fangio brothers make it the beginning. And they own the Fangio Corp, which is a holding company for all of their sugar and interests across the world. They operate in the United States and they operate in the Dominican Republic, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on their operations in the United States. Fangio Corp owns Florida Crystals, which is actually not a euphemism for methamphetamine. It <laughs> is a holding company that is yet another part of the uh, sugar empire of the Fangio's. They also own Central Romano, which is the main say of their operations in the Republic. Central Romano, everyone hear me more or less okay? Yeah, yes. <coughs> Central Romano uh, owns and operates, actually, actually, they own the local baseball team that we go to over here, they own the airport that we fly into, and they own the villa that we can have Thanksgiving dinner at every year. So, in the Dominican Republic, independent of everything that's show you in the United States, they exercise an incredible amount of influence. So, back in the United States, Florida Crystals owns the American Sugar Refinery Street, which itself then owns Tate Lyle, the British Sugar Company, Alamo Sugar, which you probably all familiar with, Belize Sugar, which is the sugar company out of Belize, uh, California Hawaii Sugar Company. Uh, Red Path Sugar, Sugar Sticks Incorporated, Red Path Sugar again, uh, Ingenio San, uh, San Nicolas, which is a Spanish sugar company, and uh, Euro SFIRSN. These groups all donate to the American Sugar Alliance, which is a sugar group, which is a super PAC dedicated to promoting the interests of the sugar industry inside the United States. And they donate extensively to US politicians on both sides of the island. <laughs> FanDuel is also donated to the American Sugar Alliance directly, but all of these companies, generally being wealthier than the individuals that own them, donate even more so. So, just to get a sense of how much influence the FanDuel's and their companies and this group have been able to gain over U.S. politics, this is from the Star Report uh, concerning Bill Clinton's affair with Monica Lewinsky. Uh, Ken Starr found that she remembered, she was asked to leave the room at one point, because the president had to take a call from a sugar grower in Florida whose name was something like Fanuli. Fanuli. Uh, the same weekend in 2016, the Fanuli held fundraisers with both uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And you can see Hillary Clinton shaking hands with I believe that's Pepe Fanuli. But most significantly is Marco Rubio. Uh, Marco Rubio is a Florida senator who received huge amount of support from the American Sugar Refiners Group, uh, so much so that he actually thanked the Fanduels personally in his autobiography, which says a lot. Even typing Fanduel into Open Secrets, where you can see political donations by individuals and companies, you can see a litany of donations to politicians on both sides of the aisle, but through the top of the list, Marco Rubio, donated to directly from Mr. Fanduel himself. So we see that the American Sugar Alliance has exercised a huge amount of influence on U.S. politicians. But this isn't exactly a new story. Special interest group gives money to politicians. It's not breaking ground here. 
So what's unique about sugar? What's the end goal? The farmer. They're donating to all these politicians so that they can exercise influence on the farm bill, which is the primary agent of agricultural legislation in the United States. And it concerns everything related to U.S. sugar policy. What you probably don't know is the U.S. sugar market is one of the most manipulated markets in the entire world. With U.S. prices being 21 cents per pound of sugar and world prices being 10 cents, more than double. That amounts to actually $10 per person per year and billions of dollars in the aggregate. And this excess 10 cents a year, which doesn't sound like much of 10 cents per pound, but it amounts to $10. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's about $10 per person. And the thing about taking $10 from each person each year, and when I say $10 per person per year, you really are paying that in the extra couple of cents per Hershey bar, Diet Coke, whatever. It amounts to a huge amount of money, which goes directly to U.S. sugar producers. And there's not that many. The Fenville Brothers alone are expected to gain 200, maybe $250 million from this each year, which they funnel back into the process and exert more influence on the U.S. sugar industry. But no one's writing about an extra ten dollars a year to their congressman. So it sort of reminds me of that from the usual suspects of the greatest trick the devil ever told his students in the world to didn't exist. <laughs> I think that's appropriate. You don't notice ten cents a year, especially when it's buried in everything that you buy that contains sugar, which as a side note is really everything you buy. And the thing is also it's not illegal. This may be a pretty clever scam, but it's completely legal. John Bacon actually quote was quote, he's a leading sugar economist who I interviewed for this project, uh, said, I would say the American sugar industry is a giant conspiracy that scams Americans at four billion dollars each year. Now, I did ask him to say this. So, but he agrees, he thought it was <laughs> And I think it's appropriate. It's not illegal, but it's, but it's a pretty sketchy conspiracy that traces um, you know, a lot of influence on politicians and lands these people with a lot more money in their pockets and you with marginal interest. But the bizarre about the whole thing is it's been able to happen so underground. Europe actually had a very similar manipulated market situation. But about five years ago, the EU got together and reformed their sugar policy, and now they can buy sugar at 10 cents a pound, just like everyone on the cost. So, these guys are able to really squeeze a huge amount of money out of the sugar industry and out of our pockets in the United States. But we also can't forget that they're the same people that own and operate all this stuff. We may be losing $10 a year. We're not the biggest losers in the sugar industry. So, and they say stuff like the best disinfectant, so knowledge about this does more than not knowing. So, if I had to come across come up with a or some of the remark here is just be aware, consider writing about your politicians about $10 a year. It doesn't sound like much, but they'd get out of San Francisco for $10. And consider going on the Virginia Care Public Service trip and stay aware. Thank you.
Il est une ouvrière. Mutual affection and intimacy 
that um, between the idols and fans, bringing happiness and fulfilling the daydream of adolescent boys and girls for love. I was really energized after watching the hip hop performances. That's what I found is hip hop becomes a common topic with friends. Today, virtually all girls age from 13 to 20 know hip hop in China. Last December, after I had taken the SAT and was waiting for my ride, a girl from the same tattoo room approached me and commented how good my jacket was. As I said thank you and chatted with her, she showed me this gesture, which is a hip hop way of sending her. I immediately asked if she liked hip hop and she got excited. Now she is my first American friend outside the world. And since EXO also became my favorite group, and I prefer a different number from Tiffany and from Alina, we get to be close. <laughs> Therefore, if you haven't before, check out K-pop, because it is getting more and more popular globally with millions of young people crazy about it. And if you pay some attention, it has already penetrated into the US, on TV, in record stores, World tours and even go via the Lincoln Center. Thank you. Please join us in the gallery for food, and while you're up there, visit the tables in which the seniors are hosting, which will show a wide